Hey, everybody, is there a Steph Roberts in the house? Does anybody want to act like Steph Roberts for about five minutes? Is there a Kelly Stein in the house? Kelly Lee. Okay, uh, there is no more food. You cannot order food at this point. Ladies, don't take orders.
Excuse me, everybody. We're going to try to start here in five minutes. Raise your hand if you have a seat next to you, if there's an empty seat next to you. So we have, we've got several seats for the folks who come in a little bit later, right? Okay. All right, so everybody do me a favor. If we get folks walking in late, it's possible they'll come in this door. I hope they come in that door. But wave them down and let them know where a seat is. Make them feel at home because we're one big family. You're not even a member. Don't interrupt me. Oh, but you will be by the time you leave. Okay, everybody, we're getting ready to start. Okay, we've adjusted the heat. We're getting ready to start right now. Is everybody ready? 
Ready to taste a little Four Roses bourbon? Good granny, you're not even awake. Are you ready to try some Four Roses bourbon? All right, welcome everybody. It is great to have you here as always. Uh, we are so excited to have Jill Pendy, Tucker Carper, and Master Siller Brent Elliott from Four Roses. Thank you all so much. Obviously, one of the most iconic brands in the world. Uh, we're going to have a great night and a chance to ask a lot of questions and learn all about Four Roses. I am very excited about this, and I hope you are too. I think you are. Let me remind everybody, raise your hand if you're not a member, and I'm not going to put you on the spot, if you're not a member of the Big Bourbon Club. Raise it high. Okay, well, we can take care of that shit. All right. I got a QR code on every table, a QR code. Take a picture of it. We have a free membership, forever free. You can join for free and purchase tickets to events. Or you can join our Top Shelf, which is $125 a year, and all of these events are free. Okay? There are many other benefits of Top Shelf, which we've just started a virtual series. We've already had Logan Welk, the president and owner of Blue Note, come on. We had a huge crowd. We had Al Laws of Laws Whiskey in Denver come on. And we have a lot of really cool things in the works, including April 19th, tips from two great liquor store owners, one in Kentucky, one in Memphis. They're going to give you tips on how to hunt good bourbon, talk about the allocation process, what it means to a liquor store, as well as you, a consumer. Talk about the three-tier system. What does a distributor really mean? How does it make it difficult, or how, does it, how do we need to maneuver that? So that's going to be on April the 19th, only for the premium members, okay? So think about that. Um, the Big Bourbon Club mission, as you know, maybe you don't know, it's to make bourbon more fun and accessible for anybody, right? Anybody, no matter who you are, no matter where you are. And I'm particularly excited about bourbon beginners. So raise your hand if you would rate yourself less than if, if, if an expert is on the far right and a beginner is on the left and middle is middle. Raise your hand if you think you're left to middle closer to the beginner or learning about bourbon. Raise it high. Okay. No, 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 guys. Raise your hand if you're a bourbon beginner. Raise it. There you go. So we've got a lot of folks in here that are not experts at bourbon. We want to make you all welcome. We want to help you with this community we built around the country. We have members in all 50 states, 13 countries, and we're doing monthly and oftentimes two time two two events a month. So we're having a great time with that. Um, do me a favor. Social media, please take pictures tonight, post them on your own accounts, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, post and talk about it. Invite other friends to join the club. We, bourbon is about bringing people together. And the more people are involved, the more fun that it is. So invite your friends to join the club. What we have coming up, we have barrel picks that have already been picked any day now. Our Penelope pick, which is in a three char heavy toasted, Penelope pick. It's incredible. I was in New York to do it, or New Jersey. It should be here in the land it chose any day now. So if you ordered one, I will let you know via the app when it arrives, and you can come up here and pick it up. If you haven't ordered one, you better order it fast because you're not going to get it. Number two, we have a, an Elijah Craig foolproof pick that somehow has gotten lost between Bardstown and Republic Distributors. I have no idea where it is. I'm sure it'll find its way to Louisville one day, but when it does, I'll let you know, and we'll put it for sale, and that one will go fast. We did a Jack Daniels pick in Lynchburg back in December. Haven't heard from those folks, but it, it's right on time. We'll probably get it in a couple months. Today, today I scheduled the Yellowstone pick. Don't get all jacked up. Don't get all I'm not taking orders. I'm emceeing an event, Travis. Just joking. We're going to do a Yellowstone pick on May 28th, and we're going to do a Rebel pick on April, whatever the day was. We got those picks scheduled today. We have great picks lined up, and only premium members can attend a pick. Only the premium members. So if you've never, raise your hand if you've never been on a barrel pick. There's nothing like it. There is nothing like it. You will absolutely love it. 
Raise your hand if you've never been on a barrel pick and you're not a top shelf. Never mind. Okay. We're going to fix that. Okay. So I'm so excited to introduce the great master distiller, Brent Elliott. Brent, thank you so much. And uh, come on up. It's your show. <clears throat> thank you, Steve. And thanks to all of you for coming out. This is great. I understand you're just a small fraction of the bourbon club, and this is a big bourbon club, so <laughs> it's very impressive. But thanks for coming out, and thanks for everyone who's watching. Uh, first off, I'm going to talk a little bit about history, get that out of the way, because then we're going to start hitting the samples. Does that sound like a good idea? Yes. Okay, and we'll take a lot of questions. I just want you guys to walk away with any questions you have uh, about Four Roses or bourbon. If I can answer them, I want, to, want you to walk away with them answered. So... Anyway, I'm Brent Elliott. I've been the Master of Stiller since 2015. Uh, that means something different to everybody. To me, it means something. Every day is new. Every, every day is a new challenge. Um, you know, some days I'm in the lab. Some days I'm blending barrels. Some days I'm out with people. And I love every bit of it. But I'm part of. I'm really proud to be part of a brand that's been around since 1888. Uh, there are some records that maybe indicate that it was even... <laughs> even... Uh, <laughs> Our founder was maybe even producing uh, Four Rose bourbon prior to that, but we know for a fact that he started the brand down in Atlanta, Georgia, and because uh, before Prohibition went nationwide, you know, there were some particular states and counties and cities that were going, going dry around the country, and Georgia was one of those. He saw the writing on the wall that uh, there was going to be some Prohibition, local Prohibition, so he packed up his company, his family, and his brand, and he moved, fortunately for us, up to Whiskey Row here in Louisville. Continued selling Four Roses up to and through Prohibition. So some of you may know this, but, you know, there was, I wouldn't call it a loophole, but there was an opportunity for consumers, sick consumers, to get, I know, I know it's a very ill period in our history, but uh, if, uh, if you had what, it, you know, could have been a cough, you know, it could have been just about anything. I guess it depended on the relationship you had with your doctor. But we had um, a license. Actually, our founder, Paul Jones Jr., he started the company. He passed away in 1895. His nephew, Lawrence LaBelle Jones, took over the company. Still selling whiskey uh, out of Louisville here. And then uh, Prohibition hit. He, uh, okay. Maybe it's probably me. But so anyway, um, he continued selling whiskey. But, um, his nephew, or Lawrence LaValle Jones, realized that uh, you know there was an opportunity to start to continue selling whiskey. So he purchased the Frankfurt Distilling Company, which did have a license to sell medicinal whiskey. So it was very fortunate for us because prior to Prohibition, there were thousands of labels, hundreds of distilleries all over the country, and most of those were just lost to history. Fortunately for us and for the sick people during Prohibition, we were there for everyone. So. We never really left the public's consciousness. We were always there, Four Roses. And there were um, five other companies that also had medicinal licenses. Uh, I won't get into all those, but you know that helped a lot of those brands to, to weather the storm of Prohibition also. But after Prohibition, we're doing well. We quickly become one of the top selling burbs in the United States. And we continue to grow. And part of that growth was accelerated when Seagram's, the Canadian company that you all probably know about, they... Uh, they were growing very rapidly after Prohibition. They were acquiring brands. They were acquiring um, facilities. And part of that acquisition in 1942 was to buy the brand Four Roses. Um, Lawrence Laval Jones passed away, and the family sold Four Roses to Seagram's. A few years after that, in 45 or 46, they purchased what is now the Four Roses Distillery. So the distillery was built in 1910. It was old Prentice. It really had nothing to do with Four Roses, had nothing to do with the Paul Jones family. But... Shortly after that, when it was brought into the Seagram's family, they started producing whiskey, or we started producing whiskey at the current distillery that eventually came, went into Four Roses. But at the time, there were also four other distilleries in the state of Kentucky owned by Seagram's, also making straight bourbon whiskey. There was also a little distillery up in Indiana, now known as MGP, that was part of Seagram's, that was also making a lot of different spirits. So Seagram's had a large family of distilleries, bottling facilities, warehousing um, locations, so it was just a huge network that was really focused on quality and, most importantly, blending. That's how they defined quality was 
consistency. So through blending products from all these different facilities, different recipes, different styles, they can maintain a consistent profile for all their products from Seagram 7 to Crown Royal to Henry McKenna to Four Roses. Like all these brands worked with all these distilleries to create all the components that went into them. So we're still, you know, cruising along, we're doing okay. And then Seagram's decides in the 50s, um, again, they're a Canadian company, and um, the founder, Sam Bronfman, decided that uh, he wanted to focus on the Canadian-style blended whiskeys. So he wanted to take the, the notoriety or the, the recognition of the Four Roses name and use it to promote a Canadian-style blended whiskey. And so that was his, you know, his motivation there. Uh, looking back, I think there are other business reasons for it. One is um, the American consumer was leaning more towards the lighter spirits at that time, the vodkas, the gins. And if any of you are fans of Canadian-style blended whiskeys, you know that they're pretty light. Um, to me, yeah, they're whiskeys, but to me they taste like whiskey-flavored vodkas. I mean, they're very light, um, much different than a straight bourbon whiskey. So he was kind of meeting that demand, the changing demand of the American consumer. And he was also helping stretch the inventory uh, because a blended whiskey, you can maybe add 20% of the straight whiskeys that you have to age for four five, six, seven years, whatever it may be. And you can supplement the rest of that liquid with uh, grain neutral spirits or light whiskey. Um, a lot of different things that you can add to it to really stretch that inventory. So they were stretching the inventory and some of that excess was being used to take advantage of the emerging European and Japanese markets. So it, we were a bourbon in Europe and Japan starting in that time period and were up until 2002, whereas here in the U.S., all we sold was that right there, or something similar. We didn't sell a lot of that size probably, but who, <laughs> who brought that? That's really cool. That's super cool. Where'd you get that? Uh, wow. It's, I guess it was empty. Um <laughs> From what I understand, I mean, why well, I have tried some of that. It's okay. I mean, it's just not straight bourbon whiskey. But because it wasn't what it had been before and it wasn't certainly what it is now, the uh, quality, the reputation of the brand declined from that period of time all the way up until 2002. And that's really kind of when the modern era of Four Roses reemerged. And that's when we were bought by Kieran, the Japanese beer company. And my predecessor, Jim Rutledge, had been trying to get Four Roses back to the United States for many years, but Seagram just wasn't having any of it. So he saw this as his golden opportunity. So the first thing he asked them when they came to, I can imagine it was a business meeting around the table, they wanted to talk financials, and all he wanted to talk about was bringing Four Roses back to the U.S. And they said yes. And I'm sure it was, they're pretty happy about that decision now. They were um, rewarded for their kind-heartedness because it wasn't really – much of a business decision at that time. And we, f bourbon was doing fine in the U S it was kind of flat. It was great. They figured they could sell, you know, a few thousand cases. So they said, yes, we can sell it in Kentucky. Little did they know that we were probably, you know, depending on when you date that bourbon boom, but we were just a few years away from the, probably the largest bourbon boom we've ever seen in the United States. So it really positioned us perfectly to take advantage of that. And, even when I entered in 2005, we were still only in the state of Kentucky. The bourbon boom hadn't happened yet, but I met with Jim Rutledge, Al Young, John Ray, and uh, Joe Dutnock. I don't know if anyone knows that name, but he's now the master distiller at Fuji Gotemba, our sister distillery, also owned by Kieran over in Japan. But I met those guys and a few other people, and, and I actually tasted the whiskey the night before I interviewed. I was living in Tennessee. I grew up in Kentucky. I went to school. But I was living in Tennessee, and I just decided I wanted to be in whiskey and, or making bourbon. So I interviewed with Four Roses, and the night before, on my way up, I bought a, a bottle of Single Barrel. So I knew the whiskey was good. I fell in love with it the night before the interview. Then I met all the people on board, and they're all passionate about the brand. They had a vision for the brand. But again, none of us knew that we were just how promising the future was going to be. So it was an opportunity I couldn't pass up, so I started out. And we were probably, we probably had less than 10 people in management at the time um, because we'd been part of Seagram's. And as part of Seagram's, you know, we were just a manufacturing arm. Like we had the distillery and then about an hour west, just south of here, um, just outside of Bardstown, a little place called Cox's Creek, 
we had our warehousing facility. We didn't even bottle there at all. So the distillery knew how to do one thing, well, a few things, but it was basically to distill whiskey. We would receive the grains, mill it, mash it, ferment it, distill it, put it on a truck and send it away. That's all we knew how to do. The warehousing, they knew how to receive the barrels um, or receive the spirit, the white dog, put it in the barrel or dilute it, put it in the barrel and put it in the warehouse. And then someone up in Indiana, the blenders up there or up in Canada, they would say, we're going to, we're going to dump and bottle brand X. So pull these barrels and then put it on a tanker in one of these, one of these other locations to be bottled. So we didn't, we didn't have marketing. We didn't have sales. We didn't have human resources. We didn't have much of anything at the distillery or the warehousing facility. So we really grew up nothing as far as knowledge or experience outside of just making good bourbon. And fortunately, that's really all you need. The other stuff just kind of has grown, you know, up around that, but we had the core. So we were in a great position. Plus we had a lot of warehouses. We had a lot of distillation capacity. Uh, we had a lot of aging barrels. So we were in a great position to take advantage of the bourbon boom that happened in, I don't know, 2007, 2010, you know, depends on how you measure it, but whatever, however you measure it, it happened and it happened in a big way. And we've been riding the wave. It's been crazy. I mean, when I started, we were only in Kentucky. We were selling roughly 3,000 cases, maybe three to 5,000 cases only in the state of Kentucky. I think we're projected either next year or the following year to hit a million cases in the U.S. Yeah. I say that like it was easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been uh, it's been a fun ride. Um, so, does everyone have a sample? Yeah. Okay. So, enough about history, but uh, I'll take plenty of questions between the samples. So, if you have any other things that uh, you want to know about the history or anything at all, please ask. Real quick, actually, taste this. I don't want to hold you up. Taste this. I'm going to tell you about the ten recipes and why this tastes the way it tastes. But this is our four roses of bourbon. This is the one that uh, when we came back to the U.S., this is the only one you get in Kentucky. You can still get this one all over Europe and in Japan, and it's all exactly the same. It's all 80 proof. Um, when I select barrels to go into this, I don't have a bucket that says Europe and a bucket that says Japan and one that says U.S. It all goes into the same tank. And it either goes to our bottling, goes right across the driveway to our bottling facility, or goes onto a tanker and it's shipped over to either Europe or Japan because they do all the bottling for Europe in Scotland uh, of this product. They do all the bottling for Japan in Gotemba at that distillery that Kieran also owns. But this one's 80 proof. It's at least five years old. The average age is typically about five and a half because we had five-year-old, six-year-old, and oftentimes older whiskeys. Um, and it's a combination of all 10 recipes, which I'll get into here in just a second. But go ahead and enjoy this. Cheers. We have our first question. Uh, the question is, why is the bottling for the overseas market done overseas? Now, it's not for these products. It's not. These are all bottled here and shipped over in glass, but it's just much cheaper to send over a tanker. So we send it over at like 118 proof or whatever it is coming out of the barrel. They take it, dilute it and put it into bottles. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's a good question. So she asked if it was the original yellow label. So, and you can find some company records, I guess, it is referred to as yellow label. But this has really always just been Four Roses bourbon. Uh, but because it had such a yellow label and it was such an iconic brand for so many years, people had always called it yellow label. Uh, but here, uh, seven or so years ago, to bring it more in line with the rest of these products, we changed and updated the, la the label to where it's not exactly yellow, but people still tend to call it yellow label. But it's just four roses bourbon. But if you say four roses yellow, I know what you're talking about, and so is everybody else. Hey, Brent, excuse me one second. Brent, can you hold up the bottle to the camera because someone online just couldn't see it. There you go. Thank you. There you are.
Brent, she works at Wild Turkey. She's, an, she's a spy. Be careful. <laughs> Sandy Jones, you little rascal, you. But she's given us some good advice, really, that there are some people out there that might have think might, might think it had disappeared. So everyone out there, tell your friends. New package, different name, same bourbon. <laughs> oh, yes, we have little cards in front of us. So that's a great, thank you, Jill. <laughs> so I mentioned the recipes. And this, I've, I've got to talk about this as we go through these different products because this is really the core of how we do things, how we create different flavors in all these different bourbons. So when I say we create 10 different bourbons, we create 10, 10 different bourbon recipes. So any given day, if you come visit the distillery, and I hope you all do if you haven't already, and you go out and you look at the fermenters, any one of those fermenters, and actually we'll go in lots of, one lot of whiskey, which is a roughly one day production. Not exactly, but just say one lot, we produce one lot a day. One lot is eight fermenters. That lot, once distilled, will fill about 280 barrels. You'll hear me talk about batches a lot, batches or lots. A batch or a lot is 280 barrels. All those, all eight of those fermenters together will all be the same. One of it'll be all of one of two mash bills or grain recipes, and it will have been inoculated with one of five different yeast strains. And that should all be on the card. So the two mash bills, we have the high rye mash bill, which is super high. It's thirty five percent, six percent corn, five percent malted barley. Low rye, um, I call it low rye, but it's still relatively high compared to most, uh, you know, the level that most producers use their secondary grains at. So 20% is still high, but I'll refer to it as the low rye mash bill. And on top of those two bases, we'll ferment with one of five yeast strains. And why that's important is these are all the same. They're all yeast. They all do the same job. They all go in. They consume the sugars that are present in the grain after we convert them with the enzymes in the, in the malted barley. They go in. They consume the sugar. They produce ethanol. Ethanol, heat. They also produce congeners, which are the flavoring components. Um, they're esters, um, higher alcohols, um, aldehydes, phenolic compounds, just a ton of different compounds, but they're only in there at a very small concentration. And most of these actually get um, distilled out through the distillation process. But the ones that we want are the ones that we've identified from these five different E strains. So we have, like, for example, the O strain, which we'll taste in the small batch, creates very rich, fruity flavors. The V, which we'll taste in the single barrel, and that's the standalone, so you get to taste V all by itself because that's a single barrel, so it's always one recipe. That's the delicate fruity strain, a little more like apricot, whereas the O to me is more like ripe red apples or maraschino cherry. It's, it's much richer. Um, the K strain, which is uh, kind of spicy. Uh, F strain's herbal, a little bit minty. And the Q strain, which is kind of floral. At older ages, it gets a little bit candied, a little bit sweet. Um, so two mash bills, different levels of rye and inversely different levels of corn or sweetness and on top of that five different strains that's how we arrive at the 10 different recipes now i mentioned earlier that seagram's they define quality by consistency because they know that if you buy a bottle of small batch today and you like it you know like the you have your bourbon you know if you like yellow label then <laughs> you want to next time you go buy it you want it to taste the same that's that that's as a producer that's what we owe to the consumers so the 10 recipes, we're able to control that and maintain that consistency year after year, month after month. And to be honest, it's pretty difficult with bourbon because I think the same thing that makes bourbon interesting and kind of magical is the same thing that creates challenges for us. And that is, you know, the rules of bourbon. You can't adulterate the flavor in any way, which basically means we're at the mercy of so many different variables and we're good. Like we know our science, we've got state-of-the-art equipment, we've got labs, we know what's going on and we can control a lot of the variables and uh, the controls in the process, but ultimately we're working with corn, you know, different crops, rye, different crops, malted barley. We're dealing with different temperatures. We're dealing with um, different fermentation conditions. I mean, to the, for the most part, we, we keep everything pretty consistent as far as temperature, but all these little variables, you know, if they line up in just the right way, you know, ways that some that we understand, some that we don't, you see variability. And a good example of that is like a single barrel. No matter how much we try, you know, I do a batch or I look at a batch of 280 barrels. They all came from that same liquid, from the same tank, same day, same lot of barrels. 
and yet they're all different. We all know that. Single barrels are different. That's what makes them kind of charming and interesting. Same thing, I mean, all the barrels are different. Every batch is potentially a little bit different. So there's a lot that goes into the final quality or profile of any given barrel or batch. So sort of to, to harness that or to um, maintain that consistency, that's where the 10 recipes come in. So we can use a little bit of this, a little, little less of that, a little more of that to make sure it's consistent each time. Historically, that's why we use the 10 recipes. Now, hey, I'm sorry. Oh, you're pausing. Oh, actually, I was. Okay, so we've got a question up on the TV screen. Alex Calling, introduce yourself and where you're from. Be loud. Hey, Brent. Uh, my name is Alex Calling. I'm from Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, got a quick question for you. Other than the obvious proof difference, uh, what's the difference between the small batch and the small batch select? Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, actually, do we have the small batch port already? Oh, we're doing that now? Okay, so how about this? I'll tell you everything about the small batch, and then by the time I'm finished, we'll be tasting it, and then I will talk about the small batch select so and talk about the differences. Works so you for can, me. Do you have some? I, I assume you've got both in front of you, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I knew Alex wouldn't ask a question like that if he weren't drinking along. No, I'm not, I'm not a rookie. Alex, your time's up. I gave you 30 seconds. Thank you. Let's hear it for Alex. All right. Hey, uh, Brent, I've got a question off of Facebook Live. Can you tell us um, the meaning of the four roses within the name of the company? You know, that's I always forget that. It's only the most important part, and someone always reminds me, like, hey, you know, why four roses? So the gentleman I was talking about, Paul Jones Jr., it's the legend, it's, uh, it goes back to him, that apparently he was smitten by a lovely Southern Belle and he'd proposed marriage to her. And, you know, this is in the day, you know, time before cell phones or fax machines even. Um, so there was something called the Victorian language of the flowers where you could, could communicate with different arrangements or numbers of different kinds of flowers. I don't know the, the whole code, but I do know that four roses is an affirmative. It's typically used in business deals, but obviously in romantic deals also because she said if my answer is yes I'll wear a corsage of four red roses to the upcoming grand ball and the rest is history so that's to you know honor that uh, occasion and to commemorate the lovely southern bell he named his brand four roses how do you say four roses in Japanese do you know <laughs> you know I, 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 no. I'm just wondering <laughs> I don't know how to do it I will I will tomorrow Ichiban no <laughs> All right, raise your hand if you have not received the small batch pour. Okay, so we just have the middle of the room, so hang tight. Any other questions out there for Brent? I have a question. Uh, Alex, you took over several years ago. Uh, what was the I would say the best way to answer that is, is like when he left, sort of how I, what went through my mind. Do you think the first thing would be like, I'm, I'm going to screw this up. <laughs> how, how, you know, Jim's been doing this for 50 years and here I am, you know, with all this dropped in my lap. That honestly didn't even occur to me because I'd worked with Jim for a long time. And frankly, in the distillery, we've got such a great team of people who've been working there for decades. So I knew that, you know, we have a solid foundation, a ton of knowledge, and all of that was, had, you know, kind of been streamlined and perfected in how we were making those 10 recipes. Um, the thing that did worry me was standing in front of people, <laughs> oddly enough. It's like, I can't, I can't do that. But I said yes and just said, well, I guess, you know, they'll find out in six months and I'll have to look for another job. But turns out I, I like talking about Four Roses of Bourbon. But so that was one thing. So, I, of course, you know, and about the same time we decided to expand, that made me nervous because we're doing, making a lot of changes. We wanted to keep everything the same. And, by the, you know, when you're looking at making bourbon, you know, quality of, quality of rye, quality, you know, the ingredients, the water, that's first and foremost. You've got to keep an eye on that. So I learned that, you know, from day one. Um, fermentation profiles. You know, we've got 
we keep a tight, very tight eye on that from the minute set, set the fermenter with yeast to the finished product. We look at all the acids, the alcohol, higher alcohols. We look not higher alcohols, sugars. We do sometimes look at that on another instrument. But all of those processes were down to an art, a science and an art. That part was not really, I mean, of course, concerning wasn't really my biggest concern. Um, as far as knowing consistency between like what I would say is going to be a single barrel or a uh, what batch was going to small small batch, that was actually something that I worked probably on more than anything from the day I started. I'd say within like three months of starting, I started because I have a chemistry background. I was running analysis on GC mass spec. But very shortly after that, I got in and barrel selections, batch selections, blending, and all of that. So I had I worked with Jim, Joda, Tanaka, who's the blender I was talking about from Japan. Worked with those guys closely, John Ray. So that was like a daily thing. So I felt pretty confident in that, and actually very confident in that. And plus, when you break it down, you know, you've got different recipes, you know what they're supposed to taste like. So if we're doing everything right on the front end, which we were doing and still are doing, then you kind of know what to expect coming out of the other end. So it's it's an art, but it's built so much, so many processes that it, as long as you're doing everything right, it takes care of itself, especially with these products. Now, when it comes to blending something new like small batch select or limited edition, you know, that's a little bit outside just the science of it. That's kind of personal preference and hoping that your my personal preference aligns with your personal preference. And I actually enjoy that probably more than anything. You know, just getting getting out there and trying out something new. Thank you. Hey, thank you. It is, I think, because a lot of people, they hear Master Stiller and, you know, they, they think that I wake up and go out and walk through the fields and, you know, <laughs> look at the corn, smell it. And all. One person can't do all that. It takes a team. So... And I came up through the quality control department, which is kind of what made it perfect for me to get into this role because I was kind of involved in all areas of production from the quality of the grains to even things that you don't consider and things I don't do now, but things that you don't really associate with the master. So like the quality of the cork, the quality of the glass, the labels, the adhesive, I was doing all of that. But on the, front end, the part that I really focused on most and really enjoyed was the blending was a big part of it. Like that was, for me, I spend more time blending than I spend looking at fermentation data or, you know, walking around, you know, checking the milled corn, smelling that. You know, it's, it's different for every master distiller. You know, there, there's such a wide array of different jobs in the distillery. And so mine is, I kind of focus on the barrels, probably the majority of the time, focusing on the barrels and tasting and selecting where they go and doing the blending and like barrel. Okay. Picks. Let's, let's hold the for a minute. We're going to be here for another hour, but let's go to the taste number two, the small batch and have Brent tell us about that. And that way we can get this. We'll pace us out a little bit. We have five of these to go. So we're all athletes, right? <laughs> and that's not your all's fault. I'm long winded admittedly. So the small batch, a good segue I was talking about, we always did the 10 recipes for consistency. Then in 2006, we were still only in the state of Kentucky, but we decided we were going to go back to the 10 recipes and start using them to create variety in our products. And that's exactly what we did with the small batch. So it started out, um, I wasn't involved with that. I was in the room, but I, I was just really getting used to blending and learning the whole process. But I got to watch Jim and Joda and John and Al and all those guys work on these different um, test blends to try to figure out what that flavor profile was going to be. Because what we knew is we wanted to be smooth and mellow, but different from single barrel or four roses of bourbon that was already on the shelf. We wanted to showcase our versatility by using different recipes. So that one's for the recipes. It's a combination of six and seven year old barrels and it's 90 proof. This one is both mash bills right down the middle, B and E. So it's about 27 and percent rye. Um, and it utilizes two mash bill or two yeast strains. The K, 
which is the spicy one, kind of baking spice like nutmeg, uh, hints of cinnamon. Um, and then the O strain that I mentioned earlier, which is the very rich and fruity strain. So this one is really a nice example. And I'll say this probably a hundred more times, but balance. I think it's all about the balance. And this has a nice balance between that spice that you get from the yeast strain and the rye and the sweetness you get from the corn and the slight sweet impression you get from that yeast strain and that fruitiness. So it's just a very nice balance. We just sound for each in each month we probably use on average two, sometimes three yeast strains. So we might be on, you know, K for two weeks and then V for a week and a half and then might hit a week or a couple days of Q. So and every month's different. Okay, we have a question for you. Uh Bill. Are you ready for Alejandro? Alejandro Okay, Alejandro, introduce yourself and where you're from. Hi, Brent. Great meeting you. My name is Alejandro Trivi, and I'm originally from Colombia, but I live in the Chicago area. Alejandro, Columbia, South Carolina? <laughs> well, yeah, you, you can hear my accent. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's very Charleston. Game talks. <laughs> So because of that, I'm going to speak very slowly because I believe we don't have closed captions. So <laughs> <laughs> so Brent, my question was basically with uh, changing in consumer tastes and preferences. Uh, what are some of the current trends in bourbon that you are paying attention to? And how do you balance tradition and innovation to stay true to the brand? Uh, great question. Um... And I will address some of that with the small batch select. Like, I know that consumers are looking more at high proof bourbons, non chill filtered bourbons. And we address both of those with the uh, small batch select. With our limited editions, we go you know, much older. We go non chill filtered across the board. With our private selections, I think that gives um, consumers a huge variety. I think that program has just exploded. If you guys aren't uh, familiar with that, that's where. We invite retailers um, to come in from all over the country, and they can select from all 10 of the recipes. We actually roll 10 recipes out when we have them, which is fortunately most of the time now. But when we have all 10 recipes, they can taste through all 10 barrels, select their recipe, and we'll bottle that for them at barrel strength, non-chill filtered. So that is fortunate for us. I think that's very um, real innovation, and it's very satisfying to the consumer. Um, and it kind of has to be that way because even when we look at some of the other kind of innovation that's going on, we haven't really been afforded the opportunity to, to do that. We haven't been able to do much experimentation or trying different mash bills or yeast strains or barrel finishes or all these other things that are very legitimate and very interesting that are going on in the bourbon industry. But we haven't been able to do that because we've been struggling to keep up with demand. Um, you see it everywhere. You, it's, Hard to find a lot of products on the shelves. And you can find us on the shelves, but if everyone that drinks Four Roses decide tomorrow to go out and drink twice as much, you'd learn real quick that we don't, <laughs> we're riding that line pretty tightly. And behind the scenes, we've been using every bit of production capacity that we have to create that liquid, to create those 10 recipes, just to create these products. So we've been almost too busy to get ahead or too busy to have too full of capacity to have any time or facility space to try anything else. But again, we're very fortunate because with those 10 recipes, we can sort of pull back the curtain and let the consumers see the 10 recipes. We can put out different products that all taste different just within those parameters of the 10 recipes, the extra dimension of age, proof, non-chill filtered, um, chill filtered, that sort of thing. Alejandro, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. you. John, did you have a question? The difference warehouse to warehouse? Oh, okay, the difference. Yeah, that's by design too. So for those of you that aren't aware, our warehouses are a lot different than the traditional warehouse you see. Um, they hold about the same amount of barrels as like an average size warehouse, about 20,000 barrels, but they're not nearly as tall. They're single-story warehouses, 
So they're a lot longer and a lot wider. Each one is on about one acre, or it is one acre. And the, that was done pretty much because of the 10 recipes. That and the fact that back in the late 50s, early 60s, they were tired of rotating barrels. So that was really, across the board, that was very standard back then, to go in every couple of years and take the barrels from the top and put them at the bottom and vice versa. And <clears throat> so Seagram's had the great idea, it really is a great idea, to instead of dealing with that, because it was all about the temperature variation. You know, it was multi-tiered warehouse in the middle of August. You know, it was pretty comfortable in the bottom tier, and at the top, you know, you'd probably dehydrate and die in minutes. You know, it's just huge difference. And so you can imagine what that's doing to your whiskey and because aging in the barrel has everything to do with, with temperature. So Seagram's had the idea to make them single story warehouses. So there'd be a much less temperature differential from top to bottom. It's about seven degrees in summer. And that was for consistency. We didn't, we don't want a lot of variety going top to bottom. We want variety in the different recipes. So that's the reason behind that. Good question. So there's no legal definition for small batch whatsoever. So the main difference between that and say this, it's, it's a few hundred barrels. I mean, this is, this could be two or 300 barrels per dump easily. This could be five or 600 barrels. The main difference is every batch that goes into this one is hand selected and a lot more time goes into, I don't want to say selecting the most premium batches, but the ones that fit the profile, like the OBSOs that have the most fruit, the most spice, the OESKs that are just right in, in their spice level and their age. So those are the, a lot of time goes into hand selecting those batches, doing test blends to making sure that that small batch profile, which is, which you just taste, I hope you like, is, is that same profile time after time. <laughs> we'll post. We'll, we, <laughs> currently we don't, but... <laughs> I've got a lot of applicants for that job. That was so self-serving. Hold on. <laughs> You're asking the right questions, so. Hey, what did you think of the small batch select? What notes did you get on it? What's wrong? What did I say wrong? Select. Excuse The second one we just did. Isn't that what I said? Oh, quit correcting me. What did you think of the second drink? <laughs> what did you all get? What notes did you get? Apple. What else? Cinnamon. Cinnamon. Speak up Bullet loud. Fruit, Be yeah. Vanilla. Did you all like that? What the hell was it? Small batch. I thought I said small batch, no? I said small batch select. Yeah. That comes later. Thank yeah. you. You said small batch, but you... I also said select. Thank you. So sorry. <laughs> not technically. I was wrong. testing everybody. <laughs> it, thank okay. you, Mark, for correcting me. So has select been poured yet? Okay. Well, I will answer the question about the difference right now um, while that's being poured. So that was small batch. I hope you all loved it. Uh, all those tasting notes. I I couldn't agree more. I mean, I get fruit. I get vanilla. I get the cinnamon. I get the spice. It's all balanced, very mellow, great mouthfeel. It's a great small batch. And that was really when the small batch concept was born. So we kept it alive with this small batch limited edition. But that was 2006. Now, we put out the limited editions every year. We started doing private selections in like 2008. But we really didn't put out a new product whatsoever, like a standard product, until 2019 when we released the small batch select. And so when this came about, we realized, you know, it's probably time to add a new product. So we were just throwing things out to see what would stick. And like I mentioned, we were also just trying to keep up with the demand. So when the time came, we had a little bit of extra liquid. Um, we looked at the, the modern bourbon consumer and looked at what they were looking for and what we maybe weren't offering in these other products. Higher proof, non-chill filtered. We also knew that we wanted to keep with the whole small batch um, idea and create a totally new flavor profile by using the 10 different recipes. So what this is, higher proof, non-chill filter, and it's six unique recipes. 
It does share two of the recipes with small batch. So it does have the OBSK and the OESK there in this kind of a small percentage, just kind of to balance out what I think the heart of the flavor of this is. And the heart of the flavor on this is um, the combination of the V strain and the F strain. The V is the uh, same strain as the single barrels, the delicate, fruity, kind of apricot, um, pear, light green apple type flavors with the F strain, which to me is super unique. And the reason we had a lot of F is um, I also do the production playing. So each year, like, I don't do forecasting. I, I pity the people who have to do that because it's, it's a thankless job and you're never right. So I look at the forecast and say, okay, I'll back into that and say, okay, if we're going to sell this much small batch in six years, we need to produce this many OBSKs, OBSOs, and for everything like that. But I was, I really always enjoyed the Fs. And they're in, and prior to this, they were in here at, you know, like 8% total. So we'd produce a handful of F batches each year. And, but I always really love that one. So I thought, well, let's produce, you know, a few extra batches every year. Just, it can't hurt anything. I like it. Uh, we might end up using it sometime in a new product. Um, if not, okay, we'll go from 8% to 8.5%. You know, it's not a big deal to just use that excess F in here. So, Brent, uh, rumor is, is that Mark Habal likes the Fs too. That was a joke, everybody. Come on. <laughs> okay. We've okay. got a question uh, out of uh, Bill Reynolds. Do we have somebody? Margarita. Hello. Margarita, say your name and where you're from. My name is Margarita Scouton, and I'm from Abilene, Texas. Um, and I have a few questions for you. So um, I've watched a couple of different podcasts um, or, uh, you know, videos on YouTube, and I've seen uh, you speak. And you're very, very technical, and um, rightfully so. And um, I think you had a chemistry background, and I was curious about how you separate all those technical things in your, your mind as you taste when you just want to sit down and just kind of enjoy it, you know? Um, and uh, I was wondering what proof, you know, is like your sweet, like that sweetness for you. And um, uh, just kind of what is in the works, uh, like what's in your mind for that kind of the next thing, so. Okay, uh, great question. So I do think in scientific terms a lot when I'm doing certain portions of my job or you know certain aspects of my job but when it comes to tasting i'm aware of it but i really push that aside it's all about just the the flavors um how they work together if i'm blending or you know what i like and i don't even have to i don't even like tasting notes really i don't even and that's not even scientific but i guess in a sense this because you're breaking it down into its components i don't even usually if i'm just tasting by myself I don't even break it down to tasting notes. So I certainly don't say that that's kind of heavy on the ethyl acetate or, you know, where's the, the <laughs> yeah, the, the amyl alcohols in this one are through the roof. You know, I don't, I don't even, I don't even think apple or I don't even think pear. Typically when I'm enjoying it, I just enjoy it. Um, now when I'm, I have to do tasting notes a lot, so I do sort of break it down, but it's very easy for me to sort of separate the, I guess what you call the art or the enjoyment from the science and they they kind of live in harmony and they work together but you know there's really nothing all that exciting about enjoying a bourbon and thinking a lot about that science so i don't know if that's a good answer but that's kind of how i try to do it and what i'm what i'm excited about um i guess just the continual growth and I don't know, just going to work every day and, and meeting people. It's just such a great industry and uh, just so lucky to be a part of it, you know, now. And I mentioned earlier that, you know, I never thought I'd stand up in front of people. I was probably in chemistry because I figured they'd put me in a dark room in a lab coat and I could be by myself. And probably, too, because anytime I spoke in front of a crowd before, I didn't know what I was talking about. And I was probably winging it on a book report or something. And I was so I was nervous for that reason. But um now that I'm talking about something I know a lot about and love about and the audiences are always, or people are enjoying themselves and they want to know about the bourbon. And so it's a totally different environment than getting graded for, you know, a book report that I, for a book I didn't read. 
Margarita, thank great Thanks, question. Margarita. It's always good to get in the master distiller's head, not about how just to make it, but about how he thinks about it. Is that? Uh, do we have another question? Is that Mr. Woosley? Introduce yourself, sir. It is. Hey, Brent. Eric Woosley in Huntsville, Alabama. Hey, Brent. Eric? He's on the rich side of Huntsville. Let me tell you. Yeah. Yeah. That means we have shoes. <laughs> so, so. Um, I won't be long winded. My first my first uh, drink of Four Roses came in the early 2000s at a bar in Pasadena, and it was a, a special Japanese release. Um, and I loved it. Uh, and I'd never heard of Four Roses at the time. I was in my early 20s. So I'd, I wasn't a big uh, bourbon or whiskey guy, but it, it kind of kept track of Four Roses uh, throughout the years. And uh, the name I kept seeing was Al Young. Uh, every every time you hear Four Roses, there was an Al Young, and this guy uh, apparently was a per, uh, pretty big personality. And, and I heard he passed away uh, a couple of years ago. I was curious, you know, what your experience was with Al because that seemed like a really cool guy. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Who in here met Al? Oh man, I'm, I'm really sorry for anyone that didn't get a chance to meet Al. He was, you know, I, I mentioned his name a few times because when I started, he was the manager of the distillery. So I got to work closely with him in that capacity, learned a lot from him. And then I think in 2008, so there was some overlap there. Where we worked in production together. And then in 2008, he was, I don't know if you'd call transferred, but his job changed dramatically. He went from plant manager to brand ambassador slash historian, which was really the role he was born to play. And he was an excellent manager, but if you've heard the guy talk, if you've read his book, if you've seen the archive collection that he put together, I mean, the man was a natural-born storyteller. I think he actually majored in theater. He, he would tell great stories about how he was trying to get a job in theater, and his wife said, basically, I think, gave him an application, said, you got to make some money. And she made him and tried to get him to go work at Seagram's back in 1967. And so, I mean, he'd been through the ups and downs of Four Roses, and he could tell you the history, and he could tell you the stories, and he could make you laugh. I mean, he was just a fantastic brand ambassador. And yeah, he passed away um, December of 2019, and yeah, we everybody at Four Roses still miss him. I talk to, anytime I'm out, people bring up Al Young. I mean, he was, a, yeah, <laughs> raise up to Al. <laughs> Cheers. Eric, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. So let's do this. Um, does everybody have the single barrel, the third pour? Raise your hand if you don't have it. Okay. Why don't we try the single barrel and see what you think? And as you do that, I'm going to thank a few sponsors if I can. So Brent, let me back here for one second. Uh, so everybody here knows Mint Julep Tours and Sean Higgins. He's a great partner of ours. Buster's Liquor Store, Josh Hammond may be on. He, I'm not sure if he got on tonight or not on Welcome down in Memphis. Um, Shannon Smith, stand up. <laughs> Shannon uh, is a great partner of the Big Bourbon Club. Not Rival Liquor up in, in uh, Covington. She is also uh, an attorney that owns Shan uh, Smith Law. And they do a lot of work in the liquor, in the distillery, in the bourbon world. And they're leading attorneys in this space. Shannon, thanks so much for the partnership. Alex, driving her down here from Cincinnati today. Element 502, Bill Reynolds back in the back. Raise your hand, Bill. Bill's doing all the production on Welcome. Charles Renee is behind us. Put up the cameras, the sound. He's actually producing it all. Charles, thank you for under production. Our accounting group, and those are our sponsors, and we greatly appreciate it. Uh, poor Cress is out third time in California, to wherever the hell he is, but Cress Brad, my partner and our host at uh, Joe's Older Than Dirt. Let me remind you real quick, and I'm going to tell you one more time. Um, thank the ladies in the back, Carter and Rachel. They're doing a great job. Now, now listen. I know they look independently wealthy, but they like tips. So they're doing a great job. Make sure you tip them handsomely. But more importantly, make sure you pay them. Don't get out of here in a hurry and you don't grab your way. So ladies, thank you. Okay, so 
let's do this. And Brent's telling us about number three. We'll take some on-site questions now. Go ahead, Travis. Okay. Yes. Always the exact same every time. Okay. Do we rotate through the recipes? Like I, I said, small batch is four recipes. Small batch is like the six recipes. Is it always the same recipes? Do we rotate them in and out? They're always the same. So small batch select is always going to be the same six. Small batch is always going to be the same four. Now we do this changes by design all the time. Every year this could be, this is the limited edition. This will be our last four. And I believe we'll also raffle, raffle this one off tonight. Yes. The weirdest tasting note that anyone's ever attributed to Four Roses. I'll tell you, I probably heard the weirdest ones in the sensory lab. Like, when we're all sitting around, like, it's all about the language. Like, we have certain terms, and I know that, you know, if, if Chris says, you know, uh, cotton candy, I know what flavor he's talking about. Um, I would say one that I use a lot that I would not, like, put on the back of a label that says tastes like this. But I'll occasionally get like you know those candy hearts from Halloween and say like be mine or buzz off or whatever. Sometimes I'll get that that exact flavor or juicy fruit gum. Yeah, it's just some of those unique, you know, kind of fruity um candy like aromas. Yes. No, we don't rotate the barrels. Uh once we got the single story warehouses, we stopped that. So no rotation whatsoever. We don't need to. Yes. <laughs> That's tough. I would say, I mean, none of these would be the wrong answer if you're playing like statistics. If you're, if, they're, if you're at home gambling on what I'm going to pick up, this would probably be a pretty safe bet. I'd say more, I'd probably pull this one out a little more often than the others. But it could be also, that's, that's going to be the next, after the single barrel, this will be the next one. This is the small batch select. This one? Okay. Um, well, I'll get to that in just a second. We're doing the single barrel now. But I'll tell you all the, well, I kind of did it's the F, V, and uh, K. And then both mash bills. Uh, yes. Are you willing to talk about your commitment to your history of your I'll tone it down, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you a version of it. <laughs> so I, I spent a lot of time. I spent a lot of time reading about it before I became 21. I'd read a lot of wonderful things. <laughs> What's that? Oh, she said, would you be willing to talk about your early experiences with bourbon? My personal introduction to bourbon. Um, so it was a lot of, uh, a lot of bourbon and Coke. That was really my first introduction. Um, I think it was I, a lot of Jim Beam. I drank a lot of Jim Beam and Coke. And I still love Jim Beam, but I don't like bourbon and coke that I, I tell people all the time is like drink what you want and you, you teach his own you know cocktails bourbon and coke whatever and i like all those but it's just that that makes doesn't work for me anymore brent what did you like to drink up at uk um actually at uk that was the first time i drank bourbon that wasn't with coke probably um i was still drinking it with coke but I think, I can't remember what year Woodford Reserve came out, but I remember actually some friends and I bought a bottle of that. We're like, wow, fancy bourbon. You know, it's from Kentucky. We're kind of proud of it. And 
So I tried Woodford Reserve. And then the first time that I really, I really think I turned a corner in my perception of bourbon was I was actually, funny enough, I was out in Colorado. I was out, some friends and I drove out to visit another friend out there. And it was in Boulder, Colorado. And he's like, man, there's some awesome bourbon out here. It was Knob Creek. And so, you know, that was really some of the, prior to that, you know, most bourbon, I mean, Woodford Reserve, that was marketed a little different way. It was, you know, special bourbon. But a lot of times you got your 80 proof, your 90 proof. And there wasn't a market for single barrels and you know, Blanton's and, you know, some of those really started to change that. But Knob Creek was one of those first of the small batch bourbons that was, you know, more hand selected barrels, a more crafted approach to making bourbon. And I still remember because I, I would like to say it was like, oh, yeah, and sipping on it. I shot it. And I, and I remember thinking, yeah, it's good bourbon. But I was so proud that I was like, I'm... I'm all the way out here, you know, far from Kentucky. Maybe that was part of it. It was like, and here I am experiencing something that I could be so proud of as a Kentuckian that originated in Kentucky and that people out here are catching on to. And so that was the next sort of turning point in the journey. And then the next one was I had a roommate. Uh, it was, I, was, I had the job before this job. Uh, this is probably 2001. And he started drinking bourbon on the rocks. And... I started getting into that and started buying different bourbons. So I started, I guess, branching out and really appreciating bourbon just a few years before I ended up at Four Roses. Hey, Brent, um, I'm a UK guy, and uh, I drove to Colorado in college with one guy in this room. You don't know who it is, but if you can pick him out in five seconds, I'll get you a bottle of Knob Creek. Just put... Stand up. Stand up who the lucky guy was that drove me to Colorado and drank a hell of a lot of bourbon with me in college. Jack Meredith. Oh. Yes, sir. I was he, kind of just pointing he, at that table, hoping that I got uh, – yeah, yeah, that's right. That's what I was pointing at. He drove like my grandmother. He wouldn't go more than 40. It took two or three days to get there. It's a bunch of horse shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, are your neighbors complaining? <laughs> <laughs> it's not true, Brent. Now, come on. He's talking about a neighbor of yours in Frankfurt. <laughs> yep. I almost got the bottle. <laughs> there was a question there. What is whiskey mold? What are, we, what are these neighbors talking about when you read about whiskey mold? Yeah, so you see it a lot around aging warehouses. And I... I don't know like the scientific name of it or anything, but it's a specific, it's harmless mold that I guess thrives in an atmosphere where there's a low level of alcohol because it must be pretty sensitive to it because, and you can, there are places where it will grow where you can't even smell the alcohol and you only lose about 4% from a barrel a year. So just like it's a small minute amount in the atmosphere can, I guess, serve to, yeah, serve a nutrient or, Yes. Um, yes. Yes. Um, it's still not easy. Okay, here's a good example. I mean, I talk about you know, for consistency, especially up to like six or seven years, top to bottom, for the most part, very consistent. You start going out eight, nine, 10, 11 years, differences. you start seeing a lot of differences from the first year to the sixth year. Just you extrapolate that time and those temperature differences year after year after year. And we'll even see, um, and I, I wish I had a, the samples here, you know, in a vertical for you to taste, but a good way just to illustrate that without looking at the, or without tasting is to look at the proof. And some barrels, like, for example, if we had, if I put in a batch of barrels, first year of the sixth year, and let them age 20 years, and went and pulled the first tier out, it could be 95 proof. The top tier could be 135. Yes, sir. It, yeah. So you'll see a lot of people like with the private barrel programs, people search for those high tier barrels from us because it's that temperature really creates that much of a difference in proof. So you can imagine it changes the flavor a lot too. And so everyone has that sweet spot.
Um, you know, I get asked that a lot. I know people, especially now that we do the private barrel program, you know, you have those different sections. I think it, by design, our warehouse should be all consistent because they're the same design, same elevation, same location. Um, but, you know, some people swear by certain locations. I think a lot of it probably more has to do with certain runs. So, like, the way we'll do it, or the way we tried to work, our warehouses are getting kind of full now, so we're building a lot more. But ideally, we put in all of the production from one month in one warehouse, then we move to the next warehouse and move like that so that if something happens to a warehouse, we don't lose six months of production. We'll lose one month of production and for every 20 months of production. Because, well, we now have 25 warehouses, but up until two years ago, we had 20 warehouses. So it was sort of spread out that way. Um, so I don't really, and I don't really pay attention too much to the warehouses when I'm selecting barrels. It's usually after the fact I'm out talking to consumers and they're like, man, that run in, you know, Peace South was fantastic. And I might be like, oh yeah, I know that batch. I didn't know it by its warehouse location. I know it by its batch ID, but you're right. And yeah, can't argue PS is great. I can't say if that had a lot to do with it. It just happened to be that that batch was really good in that warehouse. And another batch was produced the day after or the next day, you know, everything was just sort of aligning in the distillery that month that produced a lot of fruit, and if it's a V, or a lot of spice, if it's a K, or whatever it might be. Yes. Are all your loaders uh, in with Private selections? No, they're uh, anywhere from eight to twelve years. Okay. Did uh, what did you think of the single barrel? You all like that? And I'm sorry, Brent. What was the proof on the single barrel again? Hundred proof. One hundred proof, right? Yeah. So what'd y'all think? What'd you get off of that? Y'all love that? All right, so look at that. Does it have more rye was the question. That's what I get off of it. That is the dominant flavor. The, the rye is the big difference in this one. Because that's the that's the high rye mash bill only. Without a doubt. Marla knows more than Mark. Yeah. Without a doubt. Impressive. Without a doubt. <laughs> um so raise your hand if you don't have the fourth sample. They're being poured, so we're coming towards the middle. All right, questions from the audience. Aaron. Uh, currently, no plans. I mean, we've discussed that. I like the idea of a rye. It makes a lot of sense. And I get that question a lot because we're always talking about rye. I love the flavor of rye. Obviously, everyone else has. And rye whiskeys are doing great. So it would make a lot of sense for us, too. But we don't have any plans currently to do that. You're welcome. Uh, weeded bourbon. Same thing. I, I like that idea, too. I really like weeded bourbons. As much as I'm, you know, I love the rye and I love what it does for Four Roses. I like the idea of branching out and creating that other dimension. Um, kind of make a liar of me because I'm always like, rye, I never say rye is the best and rye is the greatest. I say rye is kind of what creates that unique and defined flavor, which is true. But I like wheat, wheat wheated bourbon so a lot. Four grain? I've got to add another grain first for <laughs> that's, Shannon. That's step two. All right, speak up loud. Good question. Um, no, actually the contrary because we now recognize the barrel program and actually allocate barrels specifically for that. Like when it first started out, it was like, let's, let's try this. You know, retailers asking for barrels. So we were just stealing barrels from small batch or single barrel or whatever else and putting them in there. Um, but the fact is we actually bottle more private barrels now than ever. That's, that's the problem. Shannon, you just come through the Big Bourbon Club, and we'll work that out with them. No, I – come on. Would you all like to – no, that's not my place. I, okay, that's enough. All right. We, now we hey, gotta, I'll give you the guy's name to get in touch with. I really will. So, hey, it's getting a little bit loud in here, so when we ask questions, kind of hold it down, and we'll try to repeat the question so you can hear it. Yes, ma'am.
Yeah, the question is, where do I know where the wood comes from? Yeah, we get all of our barrels from Independent Stave, and they're the largest barrel made. It's Kentucky Cooperage, but they're a subsidiary of them. Uh, most of our barrels are produced in Missouri. So they have two big facilities, one in Lebanon, Kentucky, one in Lebanon, Missouri. Most of ours come from Lebanon, Missouri, and the oak comes from that region all the way through Georgia down to Florida. So the whole southeast is where the white oak comes from. Uh, the question is, are we particular about nails or fences being in it? You know, I'm sure they are, but probably by the time it gets to us, they've sort of separated that out because it goes through a lot of milling and sawing. So I'm sure they you know, have to replace blades and stuff for that sort of thing, I know. But by the time they get to us, they're fantastic, and we don't, we don't have any faults with it at all. Okay, hold on, hold on, folks. Does everybody have a pour? I'm not here to hear your questions. I'm here to taste some fine <laughs> bourbon. So, Mr. Brent Elliott, would you tell us about this, not final pour, but our fourth pour, please? Okay, so this is non-chill filtered. Does anyone want me to explain that a little bit? Yes, please. Okay. So, chill filtering, a lot of people don't like it because they think we're taking something natural out of the bourbon. What it is, is when that... Whiskey's distilled. There are certain compounds from the grains that carry over distillation. Then when it's in the barrel, there are certain compounds that are extracted from the barrel. And these are typically bigger compounds that are soluble at higher levels of alcohol. So at barrel strength or at 104 proof, they stay in solution. They're uh, like plant sterols. That's, that's one of them is beta cetosterol. It's the plant version of cholesterol, basically. It's a, and then there are fatty acids. And some of these, you know, May or may not have flavor. But they definitely have, they, they, they could possibly have flavor. They could enhance the mouth. And that's great. They can live in there and everybody's happy until you start adding water to it. You start adding water to that barrel, cut it to 100 proof, it's hit or miss. Some bottles might be fine forever. Some put them on the shelf or you get them a little bit cold and they start to haze up. So that's sort of the first step is they'll start to get cloudy. You keep going to the extreme, you get to where it almost looks like dissolved tissue paper in the bourbon. It's pretty unsightly. I think anyone here probably doesn't care. You just, you know, it's like drink a char. You don't care. I don't care. But, you know, someone's like, oh, four roses. I've heard good things about this. Now it's got stuff floating in it. I'll pass. Get some wild turkey. <laughs> there. <laughs> Sandy, so, Sandy didn't hear that zinger. We were just having fun with you. Which is an excellent choice. I love wild turkey. Just since okay. you're sitting back there. So everybody, have you tasted? What do y'all think? All right. Um, Brent, I've got a question from Facebook Live, and let me read it to you. Hold on. Let me find it. I just had it up. Okay. Scott Rodnier is out of Bellevue, Washington. He says, taste and flavor profiles are the most important, but is there anything done other than aging to achieve good viscosity mouthfeel in your bourbon? Yes, and it's funny that you mentioned that or had that question with this product. Because I think they're basically, or of all of our recipes, I kind of look at them as like different tools in a tool chest. You have different ones that achieve different flavor profiles, or in this case, some of some create more mouthfeel, a longer finish. And there are two yeast strains in particular that I really go to if I'm doing like a blend for limited edition, if I'm looking for outside just the range of flavors, but more mouthfeel or a longer finish. And both those are the F and the V. And those are the two dominant yeast strains in the small batch select. So for me, apart from the uniqueness, and I get you know kind of an herbal, almost clove-like flavor, I get delicate fruit, I get a lot of different flavors and a lot of complexity. But it's about the mouthfeel for me and and that finish. It's just so viscous, so rich. And so that's really, you know, it's it's not quite um, quite the tool that aging a little bit of extra time will, will give you as far as viscosity. But it really does help to enhance that impression. So I've got the, the audience. Raise your hand. Where are you located? I, I've been there. Is it Lawrenceburg? Mm -hmm. Anderson County, you're officially in Lawrenceburg. Yes. Uh, raise your hand if you've been on Four Roses' campus. 
All right, put your hands down. I'm not raise your hand if you have not been out. Okay, so this is my question, but I think that old Spanish style building's incredible. There's nothing like it in the state of Kentucky that I've ever seen. But you feel like you're in a vineyard. You don't feel like you're at a Kentucky distillery. Tell tell us about, and particularly for the folks who haven't been out there, this is one of the top five distillers in the world. You've got to go see it. It's 45 minutes the road and it's absolutely unique and incredible so tell these folks who haven't been out there what they're missing yeah you've got to come out no doubt about it it's unique we've got especially now i mean and have you been out since uh december 2021 or yes okay so you okay so we have a visitor too so it's already fantastic (laughs) you can get (laughs) t-shirts But, and, and I mentioned that Al Young archive. You can see a lot of Al Young's archives. There we've got a new bar, 1888. It's like 14,000 square feet inside, and we've got a patio. So that's just the visitor center. But the distillery itself, I mean, that's, that, you can't reproduce that. It's built in 1910. It's a Spanish mission style. It's, it's such a beautiful design, and we still don't know for sure why the original designers chose that. But every every other building we put up on that on the grounds are in that same style. So do you, do you all get campus. the water out of the Salt River, or do you we get sure it? do? Yeah, you do. Every bit of our water comes from Salt River. So a lot of people tell me that once they leave Four Roses, they go over to Wild Turkey and use the public road and then head back to Louisville. <laughs> Sandy, Man. that was Sandy. That that was a joke, Sandy. So I was on a Zoom with Sandy last night for two hours, and she threw zingers at me all night. I'm just getting her back. I'm just joking. Don't go to Wild Turkey for the public restroom. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell a story. Like my first, maybe my second week on the job, my second week on, on the job, I went out and I was in Lawrenceburg. And like I said, I, I started to really become a fan of bourbon. And so I knew who Russell was. You know, in my mind, you know, he was, he, he was who he is. I mean, he was a distiller among distillers. And I went out to lunch with some guys. And went to a place called the Family Affair right down the road from Four Roses. And I walked in, and Jimmy Russell was standing there, or sitting there eating. And I was like, I was like, these guys aren't seeing this. It's Jimmy Russell. And it's like, they look like, hey, Jimmy. And that's the way that's, and I was like, this is, of course, I had to introduce myself. I was like, meeting Jimmy Russell. And, but it was just so interesting because that's really how the, the community is. I mean, it's not like, you know, I guess coming to us like, uh, he's probably got a driver and an armed security guard with him because he's Jimmy Russell. No, he's just sitting there eating fried chicken. I've seen his I've seen his card. It's awesome. Okay, so everybody get your little red ticket out. Y'all want to do a drawing? Yeah. Where go? She's walking to the back. I think we have two drawing items. We have a head with four roses engraved on it. Now, we don't have it here tonight, but we will get it to you, okay? Callahan's, we're not doing any history trivia. You, you've cornered the market on every free giveaway we've ever done because you know everything. Brennan, I'm not talking about you, Callahan. I'm talking about your uncle and your dad. Okay, here we go. So let Mr. Elliott, he's going to pull out a ticket, and he's going to read the last three numbers, and the winner gets the barrel. Okay. Must be a top shelf member. Keep going. Last, last three numbers is all we need? Zero. <laughs> six one. <laughs> Zero six one. Who's got it? Congratulations. Let's go. <laughs> Beverly. Come on. Beverly. Beverly, sit down. We don't have it here. Get it to you. Why are you coming up? I just said we don't have it. All right. Yeah, the Callahan. It always is at the Callahan table. All right, we're going to do one more giveaway, but it will be appropriately drawn after our final, our fifth expression. Okay? Um, Okay, so the last one, I mentioned the limited editions a little bit. This is something we do every year in September, and it's really a way that we sort of uh, showcase 
are versatility with 10 recipes. Uh, the difference is these recipes or these barrels are from batches that have been set aside, that I've been setting aside for years. Uh, some of these batches are 22, 23, 24 years old. It's rare that we use them that are that old, but they're some of the best batches because I'm always sampling barrels for you know, all these different products. And so occasionally a certain batch will appear you know, unique or just exceptionally good or just seems to be aging very well. So once a year, I'll sample all those batches and start putting together test blends to create something, you know, for lack of a better term, just something great and, and different, and something different from years before. So I actually, on my way here, right before I left, I did my cheat sheet here because I can't remember all these recipes. This one has 20% of this one is a 20 year old OBSV. So that has more of like an older portion than any of the limited editions we've done in the past. And that's a 20 year old. When we open the visitor center, we release a 20 year old. Did anyone try that one? So these were the low tiers. You know, I mentioned that low tiers will lose proof. So the lower tiers that nobody wants to go buy a barrel strength bourbon and have it come out at 93% or, or 90 proof. It's like, that's not barrel strength. So we didn't release the first and second tier barrels, but they were so good that I wanted to use them somewhere. So all those leftover barrels went into this. And then there's a 15-year-old OESK, low-rise spicy yeast strain, 25%. Hey, hey. Sorry. Quiet, quiet, quiet. We can't, we can't hear. Thank you. Then a 14-year-old OESV at, can't even remember, 35%, and an OESF. So sort of that same unique herbal character, but it's at 15%. So just kind of a, just a touch of it, just to give it that little bit of extra layer and extra depth. So this one is... I didn't write the proof, so I'll have to read it off the bottle. 54.5%, so 109 proof, non-chill filtered. We did about, I think, 15,000 bottles of this in the U.S. So it's a great way to finish the night. 50 or 15? Uh, 15,000. 50,000. 15, I'm sorry, 1.5. 1.5, 1, 15, 15,000. 15,000. Okay, so hold on. Everybody haven't been poured yet. All right, raise your hand if you haven't been poured. I think we just started. Okay, we got a lot to go. Okay, never mind. Oh, yeah, that's right. So what what else can I say about this bourbon? That it, I mean, I could go on and on. Hold on, quiet out there, please. Quiet. And, well, any other questions while we're waiting on this to be poured? Has anyone had uh, this one yet? What about some limited editions? We've okay. been doing this since 2008. Tom's had it. Tom, what did you have the 22? Okay. Well. Do you vary the entry proof to the barrels is the question. No, we don't. Every barrel that goes in is 120 across the board. And, you know, as you all probably know, by law, it has to be under 125. And that's important. Whoever put that, uh, that stipulation on, you know, calling bourbon bourbon really knew what they were doing because if you go too high in proof, you don't get the right extracts out of the wood. So it's a balance between the right amount of ethanol, the right amount of alcohol, ethanol and water, so that you get the right amount of, you know, the wood sugars and the, you know, all the different flavors. And so every bourbon, every manufacturer has their own – uh, particular entry proof. And hey, oh, I'm sorry. That's really what drives some of the flavors. I'm sorry, Brent. I thought you were oh, pausing no. there. Um, can I tell you all a story? No. I'm going to tell you a story. So there's an old friend of mine in here I haven't seen in a long time. Kelly, stand up. <laughs> Kelly Lee, stand up. So Kelly and I went to first grade together. That's where I first met her. And um, my report cards, my mom saved every report card. And for all these years, my first grade report card, every quarter, all four quarters said, Steve talks too much. And I still have PTSD when I see Kelly because the entire year, Kelly, what did we have in the classroom above the chalkboard? We had airplanes. And every student had their name on a plane. Some students were way up in the sky like they're doing good. Some were on the runway and some were in the hangar. <laughs> Kelly, where was I the entire year? 
I was in the hangar, and Kelly was at 30,000 feet. I'm like, damn it, what is that girl doing right? So when everybody gets loud, it reminds me of me doing too much talking. That's right. Hikes Elementary. Hikes Elementary. Okay. okay. So we probably have all the pours out. We Any other on-premise? Alex. Quiet, 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 quiet. Alex, try again. That one. <laughs> no, really. I, and that's the, um, the package, the memories of doing it with Al, because we, he helped blend that one with me. And, and it's in the package. So that bottle is the only bottle in that shape that we, that we have currently. But to commemorate Al's 50th anniversary, we did this in 2007. That was the bottle that Four Roses had on the shelf. It was a blended whiskey, but that was the bottle that was on the shelf in 1967 when Al started. So we took an old bottle. We took it to our bottling designer, or bottle designer, and they recreated that. We, we changed the finish to be a cork. Redid that Al. And so, but the liquid is so good. It's, I, it's hard for me to say which is my favorite just by taste. I probably have three or four that are kind of at the top, but that's definitely up there. But the whole package, everything, the fact that it's Al's 50th, that's my favorite too, for sure. Yes, yes. Yeah, because he was a uh, plant manager up until 2008. I think every bit of that bourbon that was in that bottle was at least, there might have been some that might have been 2009, but I don't think so. I think it was all from, there was some 23-year-old in that. That was the first, like, when we decided we were going to do a, com a commemorative bottle for him, I went to him and I said, Al, we're going to dust you off and get you back into the sensory lab because he'd been brand ambassador and when he was plant manager, he was tasting bourbon every day. Turns out, I think he was tasting a lot of bourbon on the road too. But I was like, "We're gonna, we're gonna you know, dust you off and you get back in the lab. You're you're back in the sensory panel. We're gonna do this." And he said, "So what do you want to do?" And he said, "I want it to be something totally different, and I want it to be, I want some very old whiskey in it." So there was some 23 year old in that one. And when he said that, I was like, "Damn, Al, it's hard to blend old whiskey," but it worked out. All right, can we can we take a sip on the LTO? Y'all ready? Take it, take a sip. Well, cheers. And, and by the way, everybody raise a toast to Brent Elliott, Four Roses, Jill Tucker. Thank you all so much. Thank you all. All right, now stay in control because we got a lot of stuff to go through. So hang tight. I've got a question from Facebook Live. Joel Dull out of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And if you've answered this and I didn't hear you, I apologize. What's the oldest single barrel? strength you've ever released uh the 20 year old that we did for the vc grand opening did i hear you say that you're going to do another 20 year old or are you referring to that one only that some of the leftover barrels from that the low tiers are in what we're tasting now all right thank you Mar uh marla Outside of drinking it, hold neat. on. Quiet, 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 please. We're not done. The question was outside of drinking it, neat. Is there a certain cocktail that I really enjoy Fort Rose with? I like bourbon forward cocktails a lot. And I don't make cocktails, I'm not very good at it. Um, but I like old fashions a lot. Um, you know, with, with a lot of bourbon flavor. You know, so I don't like bourbon to take the back seat. And I've had good cocktails where bourbon does, but I like the bourbon forward cocktails. And I think the old fashioned's hard to beat. Hold on, hold on. Suzanne, my wife, has a question. Okay, another good question. So the, I keep talking about OESV, OBSK, whatever. So the first letter is always O. And I mentioned that Seagram's had five different distilleries in the state of Kentucky, uh, but they only had one warehousing location, and that's where we currently warehouse. So that also explains why we don't warehouse and distill in the same location. So in the warehouse, we would age uh, barrels from all five of those different distilleries. 
So that O, that o indicated that came from the Four Roses Lawrenceburg Distillery that was originally Old Prentice. So that O meant Old Prentice. Now everything comes from the Lawrenceburg Distillery, so it's always O. The second letter is Mashville, so that's important. Last letter is yeast strain. It's that third letter, that S that you're asking about, that's um, simple distillation, which is how you make straight bourbon. So that was back when I was saying Seagram's blended a lot of different stuff. You could have light whiskey or different kinds of distillations, and it could still be aged in the barrel, but that designated it was a straight bourbon whiskey. It came from Lawrenceburg, Mashville, and yeast strain. Okay. Okay, hold on. I don't want to see more questions yet. So we have had five expressions. We're past our time. Brent has to drive back to Frankfurt. Are you okay to stay a little bit longer? or we? Absolutely. Yeah. Holy cow. Okay. So. One more pour. Is that what you're chanting? We've got, hey, we've got some, uh, we've got some friends up on the welcome screen. Margarita from Abilene. We've got Eric from Huntsville. And we have Alex from Little Rock. Uh, it's hard to hear. It's loud in here. But I'm, Mar Margarita asked a question that I've got written here. And she asked, I wonder what, uh, what non-Kentucky bourbons do you enjoy? Mm -hmm. well, I don't think no, he likes them. No, I, I no. I, I'm sorry. I do. I do. Um, people are always disappointed because I don't get out much. <laughs> like, be like, man, did you try this or try that? I'm like, I hadn't even heard about it. Or did you go did you go tour that distillery right, right down the street? I'm like, no, nah, I plan on it. Like, I, I'm kind of all day long four roses. So the only time I really, I, I used to go out and buy different brands when they came out and, you know, I have a cabinet in the distillery that in the lab. Um, but there's so many brands now that it's hard to keep up, but, and I can tell you like the micro distilleries, there's so much good stuff now. Competitors, like all of the, the major distilleries they're they've been around for decades for a reason. They're all making fantastic uh, spirit. And now I mean, the micro distillers are catching up and really making unique and great expressions. So I'd hate to call it just any one in particular, but, there are a lot of good whiskeys out there. Brent, is uh, Four Roses contract manufacturer for any other brands? No, we don't. We did. I don't more of the history. I don't know if you want to get into this, but we did with for Diageo. When we were first purchased by Kieran, uh, we didn't have enough sales to even run more than like three months a year. And we'd been part of Seagram's, who owned uh, you know Crown Royal, um, Bullet, a lot of other brands. So we had a contract with, with uh, Diageo, who bought all that. For a period of time where we were producing some whiskey that went into probably bullet probably crown royal and some other brands but we stopped that contract in 2013 so that we could continue or just focus on four roses exclusively how many barrels do you have aging today over 400,000. 400, yeah okay so real quick our friends who are out there in the hitherland do you alex eric margarita do you have any other questions I, no, I was I was just going to thank him for coming. This has been really, really awesome. Thank you. Thank you. It's been fun. Love it. Yeah, it's been really awesome. Thanks, Brent. We appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. We appreciate it. Okay, let me give you a couple of quick housekeeping items, and we're not done. Number one, and be honest with me for you members, our Bourbon Club has a proprietary app. When you join, you download the app, and within the app, we're getting four to 500 engagements every day from our 4,600 members. People are posting, people are liking, people are responding, people are DMing, four to 500 every single day from members all over the country and a few out of the, out of the country. Raise your hand if you're a member and you don't use the app very much. Okay, that's fair. And I believe it's probably more than that. Let me encourage you to try it. Just try it. Would, hey, listen, will you try it? Number one, we've got a new series on there on the app where we have distilleries promoting what they do. So, for example, Jeff Decreed for the last month has been posting on our app to get behind what I call the red velvet rope to talk directly to consumers. Very engaged. But they are telling great stories that they don't tell on social media directly to you, and you can engage directly back to them, very directly. Uh, we had Law's Whiskey House. We have RD1 coming up. Try the app, and we have a new table of content. Alex, uh, who's up there, has helped me a ton with this. 
but it's there are so many lifestyle topics on there that you can engage on. It's really, really good. So if you haven't been on the app regularly, will you please try it? And if you don't like it, don't do it, but I think you will like it. And so that's what I wanted to ask. Okay. Okay. Another question. Sean Kenny, who's in New Jersey, his TikTok handle is Bruiser Cab. I just know that. It's not on here. Uh, Bruiser Cab wants to know, what on average is the oldest aged barrel that you blend with typically? Uh, it would definitely be with the limited editions. Um, that 20-year-old that's in the 2022, that was the oldest except for the 23 that went to Al's 50th. I think. There might have been a 21-year-old somewhere in the past, but 23 is definitely the oldest, and that was in Al's 50th. And then Derek Burgess out of Layton, Utah, asked on Facebook, just want to tell Brent, thank you. One of the first that started my journey, Four Roses, uh, favorite to, to this day. Derek is a good friend. He's my age and been drinking Four Roses his whole life. So thank you for Thanks, Derek. Derek. <laughs> Without a doubt. We got about 15 summers left, I figure. Okay. Any other questions locally? Craig. Everybody hear that? Would you repeat the question? <laughs> no, just the visitor center is fantastic. In the question. Yeah, I honestly haven't. I guess I haven't been there long enough yet to start thinking that far ahead. Well, I know even like when I first took over in 2016, the marketing group came to me. They're like, "We're going to put out a bottle, the Brent Elliott bottle." I was like, "I haven't done anything yet. What? <laughs> what are you talking?" About? And basically, they're like, "Well, you know, we kind of lost." Uh, Jim, everybody knows who Jim is. Nobody knows who you are. So they put out an Elliott Select, and they put my head on the side of the bottle. I don't know if any of you have seen that before. 2016, it's Elliott Select. Great, great bourbon. Still like Al's 50th better, but fantastic bourbon. Um, but so I did that, and you know maybe someday we'll want to do another one, but like an actual release. But as far as legacy, I think if I can just keep making consistent bourbon the way we're doing, and I, that's what that's my main goal. I, All right, let's do uh, let's do one more question. The final raffle, and we're going to call it quits. Any other questions in the house? Hold on, Travis, one second. Anybody that hasn't asked a question yet, go ahead, Bill. Could you repeat the question? <laughs> okay, thank you, Bill. Uh, you're fired. Uh, anybody else? <laughs> no, I'm just joking. He works for free. Travis, last question. Travis. No, um, somewhat. The, the corn, which is the bulk of what we use, comes from Indiana. And the reason for that is, like I said, we were sold in Japan and Europe forever. And they were very, and we are too in the U.S. now, but they have traditionally been more concerned about non-GMO grains. And so we've been contracting with the same group of farmers from southern Indiana for over 50 years to get non-GMO grains. So they are local. Well, the corn, so the corn's local. The rye, for the most part, that comes from Europe. Um, we follow the quality, so occasionally we'll get Canadian rye, but for the most part, we get it from like the German, yeah, German region. Like the, the rye there is just fantastic, and the barley comes from the U.S., but that's five percent of our mash bill. But that's that's all like Western grown. Uh, yeah, I just, I'm looking at. Yeah, you can ask a question. I'm, I'm good. No, she said, "Can she work with you?" Oh, <laughs> that is a question. <laughs> Okay, last question. Do 
the question is the Ukraine, the war over there. We don't get any of our barley from Ukraine. I know it's a, they grow a lot of it, um, but we don't get it from that region. So it hasn't affected us. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, we're a little bit west, our growers. Okay, so we're going to draw, but before we draw, um, our next event live here at Joe's, we're not doing one in April, it's a virtual event. We've got a live event here. I believe it's, um, it's the second Tuesday of May, just like tonight, the second Tuesday of May. Penelope will come in from Roselle, New Jersey. We just did the barrel pick. It should come in this week. And then we have Law's Whiskey House coming in in June. Excuse me, Garrison Brothers in June. Law's in September. And we've got several more we're working on that are going to be really cool. So keep that in mind. Use the app. Raise your hand if you're not a member. Raise your hand if you're not a member. If you ask more than six questions, you got to join before you to have you join. Uh, by the way, a very good friend of mine, we don't take credit cards, big guy. We don't take credit cards. Okay. A very good friend of mine is Ted Mitzloff. Ted Mitzloff owns Goodwood and uh, Tom Crockett's in the back and they're doing some fun stuff with blending bourbons and working in their, in their beer barrels. Tom, thanks for coming out. Um, let's do the drawing for the limited edition 2022, right? That's right. And I want to tell you a story. Where's Rachel? Is she in here? So Rachel comes up pouring my last drink of the limited edition. I said, Rachel, pour me a triple. She goes, no, we don't have enough. I'm like, shit. There you go. So make sure you pay Carter and Rachel your bill and tip them handsomely. They did a great job. Okay? Okay, we've got a number. Check. Get your little ticket out. Okay, is everybody ready? All right, you're close. You're getting close. You're <laughs> Two. Six. <laughs> Did you win? All right, well, let's get a picture. Come on, get up here. You hand it to me. No, hold on. You must be a member to win. I am. Yeah, I'm just go, big dog. Three years I've been So where did you drive in from? Fort Wayne? Yes, sir. They drove in. Him and his dad drove in from Fort Wayne, Indiana for the event. Thank you. And Travis, thank you for inviting them. Travis drove in from Nashville. So did Thomas Reed and the family. And who else came from out of town tonight? Tuesday night. Indi Indianapolis. Where'd you go? Oh, Lexington. Yep, Lexington. Oh, shut up. Northern Kentucky. All right, let's get a pick. Hey, Dad. Hey, Dad. Paul, come on up. Let's get you in a quick pick. Everybody, um, another housekeeping item. Four Roses has generously donated each of those glasses with the LTO for you. So take those home with your ice molds. And the next time you go to Costco, look at the Four Roses aisle. They're usually on the end cap. All right. So, Bryn Elliott, Four Roses, this was fantastic. We cannot thank you enough. Continue the great work. We appreciate it. Thank you all so much. It's been great. Love the questions, the enthusiasm. I hope you loved all the bourbons. Thank you all.